From WNIN News, this is the Friday Wrap. I'm John Gibson. On today's show, we welcome Sarah Lesh of the Evansville Courier and Press to discuss her story about a state ruling that allows Centerpoint Energy to not refund customers affected by an outage. WNIN's Tim Jagalow will be along to recap his visit to tornado-damaged Mount Vernon. WNIN's Kenton McDonald speaks with Indiana Public Broadcasting's Violet Cobra Weiland about lead exposure and language barriers. And we'll run down the weekend notebook. The Friday Wrap is next on WNIN-FM with support from Indiana Public Broadcasting Stations following the news from NPR. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Good to have you along on this Friday. Well, an outage at the Cully Power Plant in 2022 forced Centerpoint Energy to gather fuel from other sources and hike customers' monthly utility bills by about $13 in February, March, and April of 2023. The Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission considered a request to refund the money to customers, but it ruled last week that Centerpoint doesn't have to make those refunds. Joining me now is Sarah Lesh of the Evansville Courier and Press. She's been covering the story. Sarah, as always, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good to have you here. Well, uh, let's go into a detail a little bit here. What did the IURC say about that, the ruling uh, that the center point doesn't have to uh, make those uh, requested refunds? Sure. So essentially, they they reached the decision um, that Centerpoint had done essentially everything it needed to do under Indiana Code to look and find fuel at a reasonable price for consumers, mm-hmm. um, for their customers. And so in that sense, what they said is they, they did what they should have done under law, and therefore there wouldn't need to be any refunds issued or shouldn't be any refunds yeah. issued. Yeah. I believe the words uh, that the uh, commission used were uh, uh, that the company acted reasonably and prudently, right? Yes, those were specifics. Yeah. Well, so can you tell us a little bit uh, about what Centerpoint uh, did, uh, you know, after this outage at the uh, at the Cully station? How did they go about uh, gathering energy that uh, was obviously needed? So there, there is something called the the MISO system, mm-hmm. which is the Mid Continent Independent System Operator, and so um, it, it's usually referred to as MISO since it's you know quite a mouthful. But yes, um, so if you hear that term, it's referring to essentially a place where energy companies feed in energy. They send energy to the MISO market. Mm -hmm. And then in situations like this, they're able to buy energy from that area that Mm -hmm. they can provide to their customers if they've had, you know, a failure like this situation or, you know, an up, an increase in what they expected they would need for the month or however long their time frame is that they kind of look ahead to see Mm -hmm. what they might need. Yeah, yeah. So that system... Uh, well, it sounds like a pretty necessary system, something that's been worked out for just these kinds of cases. Yeah, it, I mean, it's obviously a major system. I'm probably sure. under-explaining what it <laughs> well, does. You might need someone a little more <laughs> in the energy industry to do that for you. <laughs> but I think that um, one of the things there, too, though, is that when they have to do that, it does have an impact on cost. So right. when they say um, that $13 a month extra uh, that was put onto the bills for those three months um, – the, the reason that Centerpoint gave for that was a general volatility in fuel costs. So obviously, just like gas prices for you at the pump can go up and down, sure. um, it does that for major companies as well. And so the volatility of how much they had to pay for that, as well as the fact that they had to buy more power from the MISO system than they would have if Cully had been fully operational. Right, right. Now, uh, the uh, IURC, the Regulatory Commission, uh, also decided to keep at least some information submitted by Centerpoint, in this case, confidential, right? 
Yeah, so in these filings for their major cases, rate cases, or, you know, these where it's like an adjustment within a bill or something like that, there is often information that CenterPoint will have um, under those redacted black lines. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's for the general public. if they can go online or like we as reporters can go online and and read all of these filings in depth except for those parts that are redacted and usually they will say that that's due to like competition reasons Mm -hmm. or you know work product things like that that you might hear like an attorney say Um, and so essentially the IURC said that everything that they covered could be covered and um, they didn't need to unredact any of those lines for the public to see so I see well of course as reporters we've we've both looked at the documents like that that have mm-hmm. those big uh, of what look like black uh, magic marker basically yes, yes. so uh, well, so did this one look uh, any more or less particularly uh, redacted no not necessarily um, I th- I think the big thing with this is that a lot of times in these filings what is covered is specific numbers mm. so specific pricing things like that mm. um, go Going a little to a different utility, just for an example, the water utility is currently under a rate case for building a new plant here in Evansville. Right. And they have what they anticipate the final amount, like how much they'd be willing to pay to buy that. Right. And it is covered up because they're going to be publicly bidding it and they don't necessarily want to want bidders to know we'd go to this number if we have to so a lot of times things like that the state's going to agree you can cover that if you want to yes indeed we're speaking with sarah lesh of the evansville courier and press we're talking about this uh recent decision by the indiana utility regulatory commission that said uh center point energy doesn't have to uh make these refunds to customers who paid a little more on their bills uh, following that uh, power outage at the uh, at the Cully plant, uh, now uh, again, uh, Sarah, the Office of Utility Consumer Counselor, the OUCC, uh, it looks out for consumers in uh, in such matters uh, as we're talking about here. Uh, what actions did it recommend uh, during this uh, this whole uh, case? So it was in favor of the um, refund for customers, and but I, I think with that being you know finished and decided already, one of the really big things to take away from it is that in one of the filings, an OUC representative, OUCC representative, mm-hmm. um, said that it did not believe that customers should have to help pay for the repairs to the plant. Um, Mm -hmm. And Centerpoint made mention multiple times within this refund um, filing that they were not asking for that within this part. Like that $13 was nothing about building and rebuilding the the Coley issues. Right, right. And so um, the OUCC stated that they did not believe customers should have to pay that back. The The repair costs for the Coley plant ended up being about $7.5 million. Mm-hmm. So it is a large expense, sure. um, but it could also end up being something that impacts a customer bill largely as well. And so they, while they did not ask for it in that portion, it is up for consideration as a part of their um, current rate case right, and so this, uh, this moves us on to the, yes, uh, the big yeah, ca- uh, yeah. case yes the big one that i think a lot of people locally have been quite tuned into i think this is one that the public has been very active in um we talked before we came on air about the hearing mm-hmm. that occurred for the rate case absolutely packed hours long the biggest the OUCC said they had seen in something like this situation right. so it's one where um People are quite concerned about what it could do to their bills, and a part of that consideration is the repair costs for this Coley plant that failed. Right, so the repair costs would be part of that uh, that rate case. Uh, and we can uh, remind our listeners a little bit here uh, that that uh, rate increase that uh, Centerpoint is uh, looking for uh, would increase the average electric bill for residential users by about $45 a month. Mm-hmm. As you mentioned, dozens of rate payers uh, called on the commission to reject reject the uh, proposed increase uh, in that Feb- that February uh, hearing uh, so and and now now we know for sure that that uh, those uh, repairs made to uh, the Cully plant are part of that uh, are part of that uh, rate increase uh, proposal um, so uh, I guess uh, looking at uh, looking at it that way um, we understand uh, your your uh, courier and press colleague John Webb just reported that the uh, IURC's decision on the uh, rate increase by Centerpoint may not come now until about February, correct? 
Yes. Um, so February 2025, of course, mm-hmm. we'd be in 2025 at that point, um, that it would be uh, quite a bit of a, a shift from what we anticipated um, we would know from. Um, but one of the things that has stayed essentially in line is that July 19th is the deadline for um, interveners who are not in favor of the currently proposed settlement to file their testimony. Mm. Um, so while we'll still be waiting a bit for a decision, we will have some new information coming within the next week or so about what it is about this proposal that the places like the OUCC and the city of Evansville, the mm-hmm. the city council is an intervener and has not agreed with the settlement. Right. So places like that, what really about it is enough for them to say, no, we're not ready to finish this. We have to, we need to keep going before we reach a decision. Yeah. And that, uh, as you say, uh, July 19th, that's next Friday, I guess, is when all that uh, information is due. Yes, that is when it's due. Likely it would be up, you know, Monday or Tuesday just because it's a, they have to file it all and then it goes up online in PDF form. So mm-hmm. um, I would say, you know, a couple weeks from now we'll have full examples of what it is that they really have specific issues with. Yeah. Now, uh, again, this is something uh, John Webb was reporting on, and uh, forgive me if you're not uh, too familiar with all of this, but uh, yeah, the IURC extended that uh, that deadline for center points rate case, Uh, and apparently there was a settlement with a number of large energy users, uh, including uh, Toyota, Sabic, and Countrymark. Uh, What do we make of that? Um, So that is, they are signed on as interveners, participants in the case who can file testimony. Mm -hmm. Um, And so this is the settlement really, um, what you can maybe take away from it is the settlement has no agreement from any consumer advocates. Mm. So it is Centerpoint and then these major corporations. um, And there are no, um, like agreement from, as I said, the city, the OUCC, the Citizens Action Coalition, which is completely focused on energy and how it impacts residents here. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that is a big takeaway, that these people who are up there really for the individual residents are are not in agreement yet with what has been proposed. Yes, indeed. And uh, as far as we know, uh, Evansville customers still pay the highest electric rates in the state. Is that correct? Yes, that's currently um, my understanding, Mm -hmm. and uh, it has been for quite a long time. Yes, indeed. We're speaking with Sarah Lesh of the Evansville Courier and Press. Uh, You can find uh, this story and many others at courierpress.com. Well, uh, Sarah, anything else to add that we haven't touched on here? I don't think so. I think just some of those future dates kept in mind Mm -hmm. for people. Um, Again, I I know that like specific timelines for customer thoughts might be done, but you can always send comments to the IURC and places like that still, Mm -hmm. Um, emails and things like that. If you have questions as well, probably be good to reach out and um, that otherwise we'll have some information coming in the next couple weeks about the OUCC and the city's reason for not signing on to the settlements. Yes, indeed. We will uh, certainly look forward to that and see what all of those uh, interveners uh, Mm -hmm. have to say. (laughs) Again, that's Sarah Lesh of the Evansville Courier and Press. You can find her stories at courierpress.com. As always, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good to have you. Thank you very much. Well, coming up on the Friday Wrap... We'll hear from WNIN's Tim Jagalo. He rushed over to Mount Vernon on a Tuesday afternoon when an F3 tornado touched down on the east end of that city. Uh, we'll hear more about that and uh, a few more questions and things we've learned since the uh, tornadoes uh, rolled through the area on Tuesday. I'm John Gibson. That's coming up on the Friday Wrap. Hope you can stay with us. On All Things Considered, the world is brought to your car radio, smart speaker, and mobile phone. Hi, I'm Kenton McDonald, your local All Things Considered host on 88.3 WNIN. As we spend our afternoons together, enjoy local news, statewide news from Indiana Public Broadcasting, and national and international news from NPR. Join me Monday through Friday, 3 to 7, and thanks for your support. 
WNIN listeners are civic leaders serving on nonprofit boards and committees, and they're engaged in the community. Hi, I'm Laura Porter, WNIN's underwriting account executive. Learn how your message can reach that valuable audience. Visit WNIN.org, click on the support tab, and then select corporate support. Or email me at L-P-O-R-T-E-R at WNIN.org. This summer, WNIN is setting the stage for the WNIN Jazz Fest, Saturday, July 20th from 4 to 10 p.m. Set up your chair on Main Street in front of our station for an evening of live jazz. This family-friendly, free event will showcase the Boca Big Band, the Sidemen Trio, the Tom Drury Quartet, and Monty Skelton. Gates open at 3 p.m. And you can purchase food from some of the Tri-State's favorite food trucks. More information available at WNIN.org. The WNIN app is designed to give you instant access to stories from the WNIN news team and let you live stream programs on WNIN 88.3 FM. Popular NPR shows like Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Fresh Air, and insightful local productions like 2 Main Street and the Friday Wrap. Download the WNIN mobile app by searching WNIN in the App Store or Google Play. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Thank you for joining us today. Well, as you probably know, an F3 tornado touched down on the east end of Mount Vernon Tuesday afternoon. It caused some severe damage, but luckily no injuries. WNIN's Tim Jagalow visited the damaged areas shortly after the twister and filed this report. Police and fire agencies are guiding traffic at the storm-tossed intersection of the Ohio River Scenic Byway and Plaza Drive, just outside of Mount Vernon, Indiana, after the tornado struck. What's going on? You can't park there! Some storm chasers are being scolded by a firefighter as traffic slowly passes. The expansive warehouse of Kenco Management Services, which handles logistics for Mead Johnson, may have received the most damage. Uh, Roof has collapsed and multiple walls have collapsed here. Um, that That's Black Township fire, fire Chief yes. Jay Price. Um, we had a major gas leak here. Uh, we were able to get that shut down, get um, all the electric and generator systems shut down. He confirmed no reports of injuries and mostly commercial damage. But he says there was some damage to homes in the Russell Mobile Home Park on Cybert Lane. The tornado damaged the strip mall on Plaza Drive across from the warehouse and debris is all over. Carol Buttry from Carmi, Illinois, was shopping in the Dollar Tree with her granddaughter phone, when employees we, told them to seek shelter. The bathroom, so we ran into the bathroom, and it was pretty bad because we could hear the lights flickering and we could hear the tornado like going around the store or whatever. What did it sound like? It sounded like a roaring around the building when we were in the bathroom. We could hear it's like we could hear the like the roof uh, coming off or whatever the tin or whatever it's I don't know what it's got concrete or tin on the back, but we could hear like stuff roaring like it was coming apart. Well, have you ever, ever experienced a tornado this close before? Never. I do not want to do it again. Never. Some guys who probably would experience a tornado again are the ones told to move from the side of the expressway. They're from Ohio Valley Weather Watch. We this is Zach Jennings, who watched the tornado touch down. And that's when it dropped. It dropped pretty much right out as it crossed the river. It dropped on the north side right there on the south side of Mount Vernon. And it, uh, it got really violent. It was just violent. It was super fast. I mean, you saw the debris first, and then you just saw the whole thing just come down. It just... Very large tornado, um, and yeah, just you know, have these multi vortices running around, so you really you can see where it got violent. And of course, you see the damage, what it did that's as it was doing this. So, have you seen a tornado like this before up close? Uh, not because usually I chase around here, so I haven't really seen one here like that. I mean, that's not something you see every day. It just was, I knew today I had an opportunity for it, and sure enough, with a hurricane you know coming up like that, it just perfect storm for it, and it did it so. That debris can be seen all over the expressway. Several trees are ripped in half near the Kenco plant. Photos of a derailed train are circulating online. So it was a busy day for first responders, which included Mount Vernon agencies with Centerpoint Energy and INDOT. And of course, Black Township Fire Department with Chief Jay Price, who was first at the scene. This afternoon, we, you know, we were calling for inclement weather, um, and uh, you're, it's always a threat. You're always worried about that stuff. 
Um, our crews were, were on a medical run currently on the west side of Mount Vernon uh, when this hit on this side. Um, we were a little bit delayed response with it because our 911 center actually went down. Um, so they were coming back up, notifying us that, hey, that there was some issues on the east side of Mount Vernon. Uh, it, it's heartbreaking to see this, you know, I mean, these people's livelihoods, people work here, you know, they're going to be displaced from work now. Um, and, and you just worry about their lives and, and their safety. Um, and like I said, thank God there was no injuries um, and, and everybody's able to go home. You know, things are replaceable always, uh, uh, but people are not. For WNIN News, I'm Tim Jagalow. And Tim joins us live here in the studio once again. Tim, thank you so much for coming in. Hey, John. Now, as I understand it, a building there on the east end of Mount Vernon that was uh, housed a lot of Mee Johnson products uh, looked to take the most damage there. Uh, do you have anything to add about that? You know, I, I think a lot of people are going to wonder, is this going to delay shipments? Is this going to make it harder to get baby formula? Is this Right. And, and I, I, don't, I don't know that right now. That's something that I think we need to look into. Mm-hmm. Um, the company does not have an active social media presence. They don't have an easy PR person. Hmm. And so these are things that I, I don't know right now. Yeah. But we'll, um, we'll keep looking into it. Well, yeah, we'll keep looking into it. But, you know, we could see from the the photos overhead that that, that warehouse, I mean, it, it might be virtually unusable because it seems like half of it basically was either impacted or the walls came down or the ceiling came down. You can right. see bare shelves in, inside and you mm-hmm. can, like, trailers are flipped over. It's... You know, so it, it it looks it looks pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, that wasn't the only building hit. Uh, what are some of the other buildings over there in the Mount Vernon area that uh, took damage? Well, I didn't go here, but I guess at the port of Mount Vernon, they had some damage. Uh, mm-hmm. For example, Consolidated Grain and Barge, mm, right. which the the River Logistics Company, which I'd never heard of until this. Yeah. Um, no word on actual damage, but again, they also are sparse on their online reporting whether that's going to disrupt shipments to anybody anywhere. Right. Um, but, I, I mean, they're pretty big. They've got their headquarters in, I think, Louisiana. Um, right. And so, you know, there, there's the damage to the trailer park. Um, Jay Price said there there was a gas leak that they were worried about there. That was a big issue. Um, you know, there was a train derailment. We've all seen those pictures. Um, yeah. And he wasn't sure who that was, but it's an Evansville Western line. Right. So it could be Evansville Western or it could be CSX. But, again, no no injuries were reported. Um, but as know, I understand it, you've got some additional facts. True, true. And on the train derailment, I, I, I also don't know, or do you know perhaps, was it a moving train or was it just cars that happened to be sitting there? That's a really good question. I actually, don't, I actually don't know that. Okay. Um, well, but something if, else we'll try to uh, yeah. <laughs> get a hold on here. Yeah. Uh, tornadoes have a big effect in, in lots of angles, obviously. Uh, well, yes, yeah, since, since the tornado on, ter- on Tuesday, we've learned some things. Um, uh, first of all, uh, the National Weather Service is calling uh, – that uh, tornado in Mount Vernon historic uh, because, well, July and August, at least historically, are usually quiet months uh, for tor- tornadoes in this area. But uh, the National Weather Service says that EF3 twister in Mount Vernon was the strongest July tornado to occur in this area since at least 1950. Wow. Uh, officials also counted six twisters, a total of six, that developed in Union, Posey, and Gibson counties, and that set a new record for the number of tornadoes to occur in July. So again, these uh, you know so-called dog days of summer uh, historically have not been all that uh, busy when it comes to tornadoes. Perhaps now in uh, in changing climate, maybe that's that maybe that's changing. Uh, but of course, uh, we'll also we'll talk about these other tornadoes a little bit. Of course, we mentioned the F3 that uh, hit Mount Vernon. Uh, the next strongest, according to the assessment teams from the Weather Service, was an EF2 twister that was on the ground for more than eight miles from Poseyville to Johnson in Posey County. And then those other four twisters were rated uh, EF1. That included two twisters in Union County, Kentucky, one near Springfield in Posey County, and a tornado that struck uh, the west end of Potoka in Gibson County. And uh, Tim, you and I were talking a little bit before we went on. I mean, uh, it's technically six twisters, but some of these storms may have been uh, supercells that dropped a funnel and then the funnel went back up. And then it came back down again. That's counted as two tornadoes, just to get you uh, to give you an idea how they uh, how they determine how many uh, twisters actually there were. So uh, so a total of six, uh, lots of damage. Very lucky to say that nobody was hurt. Uh, so Tim, on that question of, of frequency, are, we, are are tornadoes generally increasing in frequency uh, in the U.S.? I, I found 
an article or a study that was featured and summarized on the National Weather Service. Mm -hmm. They didn't publish it, but it got a lot of attention. And so they wanted to kind of clarify things. Um, they, the study basically said that annual tornadoes are consistent historically mm -hmm. uh -huh. from 1979 to 2017. Right. So the study isn't brand new, but we're hoping weather doesn't change that quickly. Maybe it is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and so while annual tornado numbers are generally consistent, mm -hmm. um, they, they may be shifting. Right. And so the there may be um, an increase in other areas. So, for example, shifting away from the Great Plains, the Tornado Alley Great Plains, right. to the Dixie Alley of the southeast. Hmm. Uh, and that could include, you know, so significant, the study found significant in increases in the southeast, the northeast, and the midwest, and the tri-state is mm -hmm. included in that annual increase. Right, right. Um, they, they named the Ohio, uh, the Ohio Valley specifically in that increase. Is that right? Yeah. And the National Weather Service says this is this is one study, but it also is a good reason to be careful and be prepared if you live in one of these areas. Sure, sure. And I think uh, we were also talking before we went on the air, uh, again, about how lucky we were that, uh, that uh, there were no injuries here. I'm not sure it's entirely luck. Uh, perhaps we are seeing better uh, warning systems and all. I mean, everyone's uh, smartphone will go off when there's a tornado warning. Of sure. course, we give you the information here when tornado warnings come out. Uh, it just seems, and, and of course, we have sirens and, and systems that uh, it, it seems like folks are generally better prepared or they're better warned, I guess we could say. Yes, hopefully. And, and we, we didn't talk about where this came from. Right. Hurric this is remnants of hurricane barrel exactly. or, or tropical cyclone barrels, I understand it. Yeah, by, by, by the time it got here, yeah, it was a tropical cyclone. Of course, it was a uh, formerly a powerful hurricane, did a lot of damage in Texas. And yeah, those remnants of the hurricane... Uh, Pretty much, so we, we were in the bullseye of that pretty much, and uh, and that that's what uh, what's what led to all these uh, tornadoes. I guess so, and um, it, you know, it, it, and there's a lot of information online about this. If you're on Facebook, you can easily find lots of tornado videos. Oh yeah, we've got a tornado video on our website from um, Ohio, Ohio Valley Weather Watch. But there are other, also ones, of, some that we can't run because people are swearing, of course, because there's a tornado coming at them. But, <laughs> well, yes. you know, there's there's ones coming where you can see debris flying, and that was probably mm -hmm. the Kenco building for Mead Johnson. Most likely, yes. So there's there's lots of stuff like that online. And, um, you know, I, I'm glad I haven't had to cover a lot of weather events. And whenever I have, there has not been injuries or fatalities. And hopefully that trend will continue. Yeah, definitely. All right. Anything else to add that we haven't touched on, Tim? No, but I appreciate the extra info. Sure, sure. And uh, that is Tim Jagalo from WNIN News. He uh, ran over to uh, Mount Vernon after Tuesday's uh, storms, and uh, we appreciate his coverage as always. Well, coming up on the Friday Wrap, WNIN's Kenton McDonald will speak with Indiana Public Broadcasting's Violet Comber Weiland. Uh, she reports on one woman's efforts to bring information and resources to Spanish-speaking communities in Indiana about uh, long-term consequences for lead exposure. That conversation's coming up along with The Weekend Notebook here on the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. Scott Mangold's career as a chef has taken him from Charleston to Florida to resorts in the Colorado Rockies before bringing him home to Evansville, where he now runs the kitchen at Old National Events Plaza and creates their monthly dinners on the bridge. I'm Peggy Pirro. Join me for the latest episode of the Food From Here podcast, where I talk with Scott about making a living in the food sector and carving out a personal path. Brought to you by Swerka and More and their intergenerational community garden partnership with Young and Established. WNIN Tri-State Public Media Incorporated is announcing its 50-50 up to $2,500 raffle. This 50-50 up to $2,500 raffle will run from July 1st through July 20th. You can purchase your raffle ticket at WNIN at 2 Main Street in downtown Evansville. A winning ticket will be drawn live during the WNIN Jazz Fest on Saturday, July 20th at 8 p.m. Charity Gaming License Number 17170. This week in This American Life, Saeed lives here in America. But when the guys that he grew up with in Sierra Leone told him they were all in the gym, hoping that if they sculpted their bodies enough, they would find wives overseas, it did not sit right with Saeed. But then 
say, talk to them more about it. And the whole thing will be very different. That's this week. Want to listen to NPR News on the go or maybe catch up on your favorite PBS programs on your phone? Download the new WNIN mobile app and you can watch, listen, and more. Keep up with Tri-State News, traffic, and weather all from your mobile device. You can even make a donation and become a member of WNIN. Just visit WNIN.org or go to your favorite app store and search WNIN. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson. Good to have you along on this Friday. Well, lead exposure can lead to long-term consequences for children, especially if not caught and treated quickly. Outreach on the risks of lead often falls to health departments, but what happens when there's a language barrier? Indiana Public Broadcasting's Violent Comber Weiland reports on one woman's efforts to bring information and resources to Spanish-speaking communities in Indiana. Our Kenton McDonald speaks with Violet following this report. Marjorie Duarte Sheffield moved to the U.S. from Venezuela 24 years ago. She says at the time, she didn't know anything about lead and its risks. More than two decades later, she's helping other Spanish-speaking community members through the Marion County Public Health Department. I am the one that is going out and about talking about lead poisoning prevention, getting to know the population, the Hispanic population, it's important. When Duarte Sheffield thinks of the value of her work, she reflects on a success story. She visited a home where children tested positive for lead, but the family couldn't find the source. Duarte Sheffield was able to recognize lead on one of the children's necklaces. So we told them, remove it from the children, and problem solved. And those are things that fills my heart with joy, because I know now that could happen even with Jordi. Her work took Duarte Sheffield to a recent health resource fair for immigrants. Well, I'm here talking to people in person, letting them know about lead poisoning. Duarte Sheffield says spaces like this one are important to get the word out about lead risks to Spanish-speaking communities. She feels like there is still not enough being done to share information and reduce barriers for lead testing. And the need for more information and resources in Indiana keeps growing. Since Gabriel Filippelli is the executive director of the Indiana University Environmental Resilience Institute. He says there are a lot of lead risks in the state. We've contaminated a lot of urban environments with a lot of lead, just both from lead paint on homes homes that have decayed, as well as lead from leaded gasoline that's been deposited in soils. There is no safe level of lead. Kids with lead poisoning may experience trouble learning, issues with behavior, and poor kidney function. Michelle Del Rio is an assistant professor at Indiana University. She says to reach Spanish-speaking populations with information about the risks, health departments must consider how to best present it. From my experience, it works best when you are very transparent about what you want from the community to do and how the community is going to benefit from either your research or from preventing lead exposure. And also having practical recommendations that are aligned with the resources that these families have. Del Rio works with a lot of mixed immigration status families. She says economic and immigration concerns can also be a barrier to lead testing. I think there's also maybe a fear that there's government involvement in if somehow participating in either testing your home or testing your children. So maybe making sure that that message is clear that this is not going to investigate your immigration status. Marjorie Duarte Sheffield says she is encouraged by education and outreach efforts so far, but more still needs to be done. More information to the parents for the parents to request it in their children's schools. And also, you know, this is a dream. (laughs) If it would be a legislation about uh, something bigger, but it's just a dream. How to make it happen? I have no idea. In the meantime, Duarte Sheffield continues to work to engage Hispanic families through education, outreach, and resources. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Violet Cumberweilen.
And now I'm happy to be joined by uh, Indiana Public Broadcasting's Violet Comber Weiland on the Friday Wrap. Violet, thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. Yeah, of course. Happy to be here. Okay, so let's just talk about the the story that we just listened to. Uh, can you give me an idea of maybe where, uh, if people are curious about where lead paint is in their homes, where is it most likely to be found in a house? Sure. So it's most likely to be found on the walls because that's where lead paint tends to be. Also on windows, the window friction can cause the lead-based paint to rub or chip off. However, it's most commonly found in homes built before 1978, so it really depends what kind of home you're in and where the paint is in that home. Uh, So let's talk about uh, the woman that you profiled and spoke with specifically in the story. Uh, She helps people that are uh, Spanish speakers deal with uh, lead in their home. Are Spanish-speaking households proportionally more likely to encounter lead in their homes? Is that something you found? So we did not find any concrete data on this. It's not necessarily more likely, but our interview interviewee, Marjorie, certainly did find lead in Spanish-speaking homes. The risk is not necessarily more likely. It's just that there may be more barriers to obtaining information. So as I discussed in this story, mixed immigration status families may be some of these households that um, may fear lead testing information, et cetera, and view it as government involvement. Also, finances can be a big barrier that may make people less likely to be able to attend events where there's information about lead-based paint and how it's spread or to have reliable transportation to get there. So no concrete data to say what group is most likely. We know that all groups um, often struggle with lead in their homes, but it depends more on the finances and barriers to entry that would prevent that testing and education and also the home type as well. Sure. So what type of uh, support does does Marjorie have when she's going out and conducting these inspections, providing information? Is she just doing this on her own or does she have the backing of some nonprofits or maybe governmental or non-governmental organizations? Sure. So she works with the Marion County Public Health Department. So it's with the government. This is where she's getting the funding for this from. Um, The department itself offers free testing, both on site or through other outreach, such as free lead testing kits people can pick up. She actually leads a whole division that focuses on educating in other areas, too, such as senior care and environmental consumer management. So it's all through there. And uh, do we know if there's other resources available for people who uh, speak a different language besides English or Spanish? So in um, our next question, we'll talk a little bit about some other resources available for those people. But as of right now, the state online primarily has those English and Spanish resources. However, Marjorie expressed hope for lead education for all. Um, Not to say that she would necessarily be the one leading that, but that could potentially be something in the future if there was interest in resources allotted to it. Well, let's move right ahead to the next question. Where can people learn more uh, about these resources if English is not their first language? Sure. So the Marion County Public Health Department in particular has bilingual resources. Um, If you're not located in that county, there are several other counties on their websites that have this as well. Um, You would probably want to look under language translation and migrant programs is the Marion County Public Health Department's um, division of the website that says that, but other health departments I've noticed have that as well. So just looking up to see what language translation resources are available and oftentimes those different language resources um, for the various languages will be able to offer that information about lead and other health things as well. Okay, Violet, thanks so much for your reporting on this topic and uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, that's Indiana Public Broadcasting's Violet Comber Weilen back after this on the Friday Wrap. If you close your eyes and you think about a red apple, mm. what did you see? On the next Radio Lab. I cannot hear music without having a complete music video. <laughs> it's like I have a TV on in the background. What does it mean to see in your mind? I can also walk through my entire childhood house. I can go into the backyard. I can walk to my friend's house. Or not. Like if I close my eyes and think about it, <laughs> like it's really just black. That's on the next Radio Lab. The WNIN app is designed to give you instant access to stories from the WNIN news team and let you live stream programs on WNIN 88.3 FM. Popular NPR shows like Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Fresh Air, and insightful local productions like 2 Main Street and the Friday Wrap. Download the WNIN mobile app by searching WNIN in the App Store or Google Play. This summer, WNIN is setting the stage for the WNIN Jazz Fest, Saturday, July 20th from 4 to 10 p.m. 
Set up your chair on Main Street in front of our station for an evening of live jazz. This family-friendly, free event will showcase the Boca Big Band, the Sidemen Trio, the Tom Drury Quartet, and Monty Skelton. Gates open at 3 p.m. And you can purchase food from some of the Tri-State's favorite food trucks. More information available at WNIN.org. WNIN's listeners could be your best customers. We all find value in public radio, and research shows that 85% of listeners are more likely to take advantage of a business or service they've heard about on public radio. So if you enjoy listening to WNIN, why not invite your fellow listeners to become your customers? Call 812-423-2973 for more information. It's the Friday Wrap on WNIN-FM. I'm John Gibson, and it's time for the Weekend Notebook. Well, events happening this weekend all seem to be happening on Saturday. At least that's uh, what we have at this point. Uh, So let's start with uh, tomorrow, Saturday. Uh, We begin with a low-price vaccine clinic at the Vanderburg Humane Society. The event is from 7.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at the Society at 400 Milner Industrial Drive. That's just west of Garvin Park. It's an opportunity to get your pets immunized at a low cost. Officials emphasize it's a vaccine clinic, not a spay-neuter event. Again, that low-price vaccine clinic at the Vanderburg Humane Society tomorrow from 7.30 in the morning until 1.30 in the afternoon. Also happening this weekend, it's the City Swim Meet at the Deaconess Aquatic Center. Warm-ups for the annual meet start at 8 8 a.m. tomorrow, and races start at 9 a.m. both Saturday and Sunday. Swimmers from the Lloyd, Helfrick, Rochelle, Lorraine, and Howell swim teams will be competing. Those pools will be closed to public swimming for the event this weekend. And of course, if it's Saturday, that means the Franklin Street Bazaar, at least this time of year, right? This uh, free event is from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. in the 2000 block of West Franklin Street. You'll find farmers, producers, vendors, and artisans in the library park, also food trucks parked on the street. Again, that's the Franklin Street Bazaar on West Franklin Street from 9 a.m. until 1 on Saturday on Evansville's west side. We also have the Evansville Farmer's Market happening tomorrow. That market is open from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at 815 John Street. That's just off the Lloyd Expressway between Main Street and Highway 41. Again, that's the Evansville Farmer's Market happening between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. in the 800 block of John Street here in Evansville. Also happening on Saturday, we have Animal Tales at Oakland Library. You and your kids can meet some small animals and learn about how they help each other in nature. This free event is from 10 to 11 a.m. at the library off Oak Hill Road. Again, that's Animal Tales at Oakland Library here in Evansville. Also happening on Saturday, we have a storm spotting workshop. Very appropriate in the wake of uh, this week's tornadoes, of course. The Evansville Tri-State Skywarn Network will teach you how to identify and track severe weather. This free event features meteorologist Wayne Hart. It happens from 1 to 3 p.m. at McCullough Library. That's tomorrow afternoon from 1 to 3 at McCullough. That's a storm spotting workshop conducted by the Evansville Tri-State Skywarn Network. Also happening Saturday evening, it's time for another On the Roof concert at the Arts Council. The Boat Monkeys and Bethany Gillespie will be performing on the roof of the Arts Council building at 212 Main Street. The doors open at 6.30 with the music starting at 7 tomorrow night. Admission is free. There is a cash bar for guests 21 and over. If you have an event coming up and you'd like us to mention it here on the Weekend Notebook, send the information to me, Jay Gibson, that's the the letter J-G-I-B-S-O-N, at WNIN.org, and we'll try to get your event on the Weekend Notebook. That will wrap up the Friday Wrap for this Friday. I'd like to thank all of our guests today, including Sarah Lesh of the Evansville Courier and Press. Also, a big thanks to WNIN's Tim Jagalow. Also, thank you to WNIN's Kenton McDonald and his guest today, Violet comber Wylan of Indiana Public Broadcasting. Thanks to all of those folks. Also, a big thanks to Jevin Redman for engineering today's show. 
Thanks also to support from Indiana Public Broadcasting Stations. And a big thanks to your support. It's listeners like you who bring programs like the Friday Wrap on air and online. I do hope you and yours have a fine weekend. And for this Friday, I'm John Gibson, and that's a wrap.